Gig Gab, episode 369 for Tuesday, January 10th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab, or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include a returning sponsor, Banzoogle, where you can go to banzoogle.com, you try it free for 30 days, and then use our promo code GIGGAB to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. We'll talk more in depth about that in a little bit. For now, here, back here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are things in Napomo? Are you doing all right with all the crazy like Ooh. rains and all that stuff? No, now? man, it is. So this area has had a lot of flooding. And then up in Santa Cruz in the Bay Area, it's been terrible. Like one one wharf washed away. Oh. One wharf has a hole in it. One wharf had everybody evacuated. Flooding like nobody's business. So a lot of thoughts and prayers for that. Actually, you know, started reaching out at a, and, and Capitola is a town where the house rockers play. Yeah. Played some acoustic dates there. Um, they have, you know, this one little strip of restaurants right on the water that are, they're gone. They're gone. Wow. And so I started reaching out and saying, Hey, when, when you guys start doing, doing benefits to help these people get back on their feet, please count me in on that. That's great. I mean, that's not great, but that's, that's a good thing to oh. do. You're a kind soul, my friend. That's good. I don't, you know, California doesn't have hurricanes, but I don't know what, why this atmospheric river is not considered a hurricane. The trees were bending over in the wind. The rain was the hardest I've ever seen in my life. So it is, it's really crazy out here. Huh? That's bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Craziness with the weather, man. Well, I hope you remain as safe as you have been. That's. Thank you. Yeah, we man. actually played, House Rockers played for the first time in two months since November at our standard, you know, local bar. Yep. Um, and it was the first night of the, or the second night, maybe there was a little, I think it rained on Friday. It cleared for a while on Saturday. And then when I left for the gig about 4 PM, it started really coming down. Ugh. So we had, you know, first time we played in two months, haven't seen each other, really haven't interacted very much. Um, and our first gig, a place that we usually pack and, we about half sold it oh. and yeah, a lot of, a lot of, and this was, this would have been here. new year's Eve. Is that right? No, no, no. Just last, just the 7th of January. Oh, the last. 7th. Ah, gotcha. Gotcha. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, um, you know, there were a couple of things. One, it was pouring rain. Yeah. Californians don't do very well at rain. No, that, that's Second true. Is, that's true. Uh, rain is different out there than it is say here in new England where people just are like, yeah, it's fine. That's no big deal. That's raining. Yeah. Right. It's uh, raining. Second, it was first weekend after the holidays. I booked it knowingly thinking people would be ready to get back out and start having some fun. Yep. Um, so that was a decision. I didn't know about the rain when I booked it up. Of Obviously. Course. Yeah. And you know, we haven't played, we haven't really had a lot of social media traffic. I made a couple posters on social media, you know, did some invites and type of stuff, but I am, I am keenly aware that keeping the momentum that we had, uh, you know, kind of goodwill, get excited to see us momentum is you have to nurture that all the time. It's really hard to take a break and pick right up where you are. I think we'd be able to get back to where we were, but, but you know, even it takes of effort. the, yeah, it takes effort. Yeah. I mean, and, and it, and you have to kind of respect the re the momentum as well. You know, like if, if you let it kind of die down, my thought was always to nurture it, you know, have a, not a, not so much an in your, you know, we, we should probably, we should probably take that little left turn detour into the art and science of, of social media gig marketing. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, it's, it's like, you know, when we had Davis Thurston on, he, he made a, almost an offhanded comment about how, what he does with the footage and what he advises bands to do with the footage that they get when, you know, when he does like a full band, you know, a full night, they'll, they'll yeah. live stream the multicam, but then it's like, you don't release the full show multicam the next day. He's like, you might release that in two or three years. He's like, what you do is you take 
you know, one song and release it next week and another song the following week. And it allows you to seem, for lack of a better phrase, bigger than you are because you might only be playing once a month, but you're putting out this content regularly in places where people are going to see it. Your, your buzz is constant. The buzz is constant. That's it. Yeah. yeah. And there's really, there's, when he said that, it really, it was, you know, we, uh, it opened my eyes or it, it resonated with me. We uh, here at Backbeat Media, which is the company that sort of manages a, a bunch of the podcasts that I, that I do and that other people do and that manages the ads for them. Uh, about two years ago, we hired someone to do all of our sort of regular promotion. And mm -hmm. we thought that doing that kind of stuff, taking segments from the shows and putting them out there would bring in new audience members. It does not. The thing that brings in new audience members for any podcasters out there, promo swaps with other shows. That's the way that's that. Like I can tell you definitively, we have proved this time in and time again. That's what does it. But those little segments of the shows, what they do is they prevent attrition. They prevent people from forgetting about you because you might put out a show a week or sometimes shows don't do a show for a week. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but, you know, putting that out. So I'm actually going to have Sadie start doing some stuff with with this show, too, because there's value in engaging with your existing audience on a regular basis, on a more regular basis than you, quote unquote, sure. perform. And uh, yeah, as soon as Davis said it, it was like. Well, obviously, of course, that's what you should do with your band, too. We've learned this with yeah. the podcast. Why not do it with the band? So, yeah, momentum matters. Yeah, it does. And you can you, you can it. create it like you get to control how much content you're putting out. You don't get to control how people respond to it. But I guarantee you, if you put out no content, people won't respond to it. It's just true. how it works. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. So. And I'm just knocking things over so, here. Don't worry about it. It's fine. No, you go right ahead. So, uh, yeah, we played for the first time in two months. Yeah. Might be the longest break we've had in 20 years. And, um, well, no, obviously the pandemic was, was a longer break. <laughs> well, longest, there was longest non-pandemic break, yeah. right? And we were butter. It was really. Oh, that's good. Like I went over stuff. Most stuff. Mostly what I went over is enough to sanity check that muscle memory is a real thing. And it is. Yes. That makes sense. Yeah. That's, and that's yeah. smart. Yeah. It gets, muscle memory is a real thing. If you can get out of your head, like if you're, if you go well, into well, like in all things, if you think you're dead. Yeah. Don't think just concentrate. Right. That's what Jocko said to Peter Erskine. It's, it's, there's, there's a lot to that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, if you can get out of your head, then then yeah, the things that, you know, you know, so don't, right. don't, yeah, don't, don't sweat it before you start the gig. That's right. And it's actually one of the more pleasurable things about playing music when you literally are out of, out of your head and it's just coming out of you. Yeah. And once you realize that your body's on autopilot, that's kind of a fun way to make music. Yeah. It, it's a great way to make, make music. As long as you stay there, you know, don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's the opposite of a rehearsal experience where, you know, you know, at least for me, people, people have, people have widely varied perspectives of what prepared for rehearsal means. It, it is true. I just literally like, I mean, we're, you know, we've been doing this show for nine minutes. We probably talked for 10 minutes before we started five minutes before that I ended a rehearsal. I had a, mm. uh, a monkey fist rehearsal. I believe it was the first monkey fist rehearsal that I've ever attended. Uh, mm. I, I, yeah. The, the first gig I did with them was a four hour, like epic thing at, over at the dairy field. And that was obviously, you know, a decade ago or something and just filled in. And I remember learning the songs while I was mowing the lawn. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know, you know, I just had to listen. Listen, listen, listen. I didn't have time to actually like play them all. That's that's four hours of a lot of music. But um, we have a, a guitar player. Our friend Jim Richardson is playing with us at the end of the month. He has never played a full gig with us. He sat in with us countless times. He's been to, you know, tons of Monkey Fist gigs. Good guy, great guitar player. But he asked, he was like, well, since I'm playing the gig, do you think we should get together? Johnny and I were like, well, if you want, like, sure. Like, that's fine. Uh, you know, we're, we're used to just going and it's, it, it works. 
but he, you know, he felt more comfortable having a rehearsal. It was like we made we were able to find a time that worked. And so we did it. And as I was sort of going into this, he sent out, a, you know, I, he sent out a list of, of songs he wanted to go through and which was great. And we went through them and everybody, it was rehearsal. It was not practice, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody came in knowing if anybody didn't know the songs, it was me uh, because they were pulling some songs that the two of them play in a full electric band together. And so there were some songs that they do that I'd never done before, but we made it work. And, uh, and I know what homework I have to do between now and the gig to learn some harmonies and like some breaks and stops and different songs. But it, you know, I was thinking about, how different bands I play in four bands right now. Uh, mm -hmm. if you include monkey fist, so there's monkey fist, there's bitter pill, there's fling. And then there's uptown celebration, the wedding band and all, all four of them at different speeds have been rehearsing, you know, semi regularly for the last couple of months. And it's just fascinating to me how different bands have radically different rehearsal styles. And certainly you can learn things from one band that work and, and try and adapt them to another band's uh, style, but to try and just say, Oh, well, here's what works in monkey fist. So this is what's going to work in bitter pill. It would be, it would never happen it, because like bitter pill is an interesting band. We get together. We have to book a long session like monkey fist. We booked two hours and it was super productive because we got here. Everybody just plugged in and, we were off to the races right away being productive, like with the songs and it was, it was great. I mean, it's fine with bitter pill. It takes usually about 60 to 90 minutes and we'll be playing, but it takes that time for us to get into the, the creative state that allows bitter pill to, to do the things that we want to do at a rehearsal, rearranging songs. Uh, and, and it could be new songs or it could be existing songs finding, you know, segues for songs, working on the little nuances of things. It just takes us time as a band to get in sync on that stuff. And it's fine. Like I, I, I used to, at, at first I would get frustrated, like, man, like we're just like wasting time, but it's not, it's just how it is with that band. It takes a little bit of time for us to get into the, the mode that we need to be in. And, and then we're like super productive, but we need like three, at three hours at least, if not four, to really my I don't know what's up with my watch. It's being crazy. It's off. Siri, you're done. Um but uh yeah, it's amazing how how different and Fling is Fling is a fairly efficient band, but we don't if we're learning a new song, we practice it together. We don't rehearse it first. You know, we we don't practice it on our own and come to rehearse it. We we learn it together. It's always been the expectation. It's always been the expectation. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I mean, the first time we will play it through, stumble through it together, then we'll go home and, and spend some time with it individually and come back. And the next time it's much better than we left it. But the first time we play a song, an original or a cover, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, we're all stumbling through it together. And it, if one of us happens to have spent all the time required to, um, you, you know, to, to, to like prepare it. I, yeah. I don't want to say that time was wasted, but, but you need to know that other people did not spend that time. Like that's just how that band is. And it, See, again, that's the interesting thing is, um, I, I think what happens is you get a, you get a social vibe where after the first couple of rehearsals, everybody takes a mental note of how, ready the other person is or the other people are and that becomes the amount of preparation they're willing to do knowing that nobody's going to have it a hundred percent like i've heard of bands that that you show up and you know you know we're, we're here to rehearse not learn yeah and that's how that's how but, uptown is like there's no screwing around you show up knowing the songs and knowing everyone's parts uh, you know it's like you show up uh, essentially gig ready but you're going to play it at rehearsal. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is you, that was the expectation and it was lived up to by everyone else when you showed up. Right. Correct. It, it, it always yeah. is. Yeah. If somebody, 
I mean, and it happens where one person will be weak on a, a certain song or whatever and be like, oh, shoot, I didn't realize this was on the list. I'm sorry. But there's a it's definitely an exception. And and it's tolerated because it doesn't happen all the time. It's not like, oh, you're fired, you know. But um, but if it happened with all the songs, I'd be like, dude, you just wasted everybody's time. You know, we got some people yeah, that are driving I'm, hours. I'm, I'm somewhat surprised that often the guy who is that guy doesn't mind being that guy. Oh, that like, would not, like, like, that would not fly in uptown at all, but it would in, right. in like bitter pill or fling. But the difference is between monkey fist and uptown and bitter pill and fling is that two of those are cover bands and two of those are original mm -hmm. bands. So mm -hmm. I, I think maybe that not, maybe I'm pretty sure that's a part of it because there is that creative process where it's, we're literally creating things together or taking the work that, that someone, uh, the, the seeds that someone has created on their own and then continuing that creative process together. So I, I think There's that's also part the buy-in part of it, right? So uh -huh. we've had some songs that I've known were going to be challenges for us. And I kind of look around the room and know, know what everybody will internalize the reality of this song ever getting done. Sure. And that will be another reason that people will kind of sandbag, you know, <laughs> Oh yeah. hundred percent done. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Russ used to say, I can't remember. We had, we had one song that, you know, we worked on for seven rehearsals and it was just like, it was like a Bruno Mars song that was like really specific grooves and really specific stops and really specific sounds and really difficult harmonies. So, you know, add all that stuff together, like a really produced thing yeah. that you can't garage band, you know, you can't turn it into a Rolling Stone song. Um, uh, and you know, Russ was like, I, I knew from the beginning, you know, we're never going to get there. No, no, no cover band's ever really going to get there with this type of thing, unless you are Bruno Mars, you know, like, like the vocals are not a stretch and you've already agreed on the key and you know, all those types of things. And so, you know, it was, you know, people look around and you, you make an assessment about the use of your time. Right. I would rather be challenged. Like I would rather be uptown. The house rockers are consistently an eight in rehearsals, often a nine, and sometimes a nine and a half. That's pretty good. Um, they don't and know I, it and really it's good. pretty good and, coming and, from you because I know that you in 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 that environment you are a perfectionist. Like you want it to be as close to perfect as it can be for that band. You, you know what's funny about that? I I mean I thank you for that nice compliment, but actually. It is more my internal gauge of fairness that everybody do the same work and oh. nobody waste anybody else's time. That that is actually more present to me as a band leader. That makes sense. It's like, yeah, I'll buy that. If some guy yeah. put in all the time, to come prepared, and and no one else did, or or another person did. That's pretty disrespectful to the guy who put the time in, and I'm hypersensitive to that. Yep. So that's it. So the house rockers. Again, we uh, we're guilty of overreaching what actually can be done. Sure. With our makeup, sometimes. Hey, but that's right? a, that's you know, I think that's a good you. thing. You gotta like if you're not running into that wall, sometimes you don't know your capabilities, right? If everything yeah. is butter, like right out of the gate, okay, well, like try something harder and see what see what you can do, like. I don't know. But you only have X amount of time is the thing. Yeah, well, there's that. Right? I, don't, yeah, I don't disagree fair. with you philosophically. No, fair though. Yeah. You, you want to get stuff done. You know, we always talk about what what is it that we can agree is good enough to put on stage. Yeah. Get it out of the rehearsal hall and, and onto stage. That's kind of the process that we're looking for. So I, the one that really got us was actually Suit and Tie by Justin Timberlake. Huh. A very, very produced sounding song, right? a very specific, probably, you know, digital drums. Sure. Electronic drums beat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That creates a groove. That is why the song works. And you're searching to recreate that, you know, with your instrumentation. And, you know, sometimes, sometimes we'll replace like a string section with, with a horn line or something like that. So, you know, it's but like, I've learned over the like years. For a, for a madhouse, I had to learn we learned David Bowie's black star. This yeah. is a drum part. I, I feel like, I think I even said this on the show. 
I might have been the first dr like live drummer to ever play that. It was definitely a, mm -hmm. it, well, it was, it was created on a computer, right? This part. And like, it does, it didn't make any sense, you know, right hand lead, left hand lead, nothing. But for that song to work, it had to be that part. Cause otherwise it, it was just nothing. So yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah sometimes you just got to punt on those things or, find another way to communicate. Like if the melody and the, the chorus work in a, it, it, regardless of form, find a new form and deliver it that way. Mm. But it doesn't work with all songs. It wouldn't have worked with that song. I don't think, but, um, but sometimes that's the, the, the avenue you have to take. It's like, okay, wait, we're trying to, to mimic studio. Uh, we'll call it perfection. It's just studio artistry that we're not going to be able to get even 80% there. So if we can't get 80% there, let's, let's, if we really want to deliver this song, let's rework it our way, you know? Mm. So I don't know. It's, it's no, no, I agree with you. I mean, it's the question of knowing your limitations yeah. and getting stuff done, being productive versus, you know, this is one that's worth stretching and seeing if we can get there, which you're right. That is, I think that is a good thing for a band. I mean, Whatever that might be, you know, Bohemian right. Rhapsody, you know, you know, it'd be, you know, pick a, a rush song, right? Pick something that yep. like high risk, high reward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like we, with a, with Madhouse, I, I still don't understand how this worked, but we delivered a version of Bohemian Rhapsody that even six months later, when I watched the video of it, I was like, well, holy crap. Like that's actually pretty good. Like, Queen didn't even do that. Not that we played it better than Queen, but Queen never played that song it's in, in its entirety live. They would track the beginning of it and then just come in with a bam, ba -da -dum, dum, ba -da -dum, dum, you know, there were none of those harmonies and everything happening live. They would just play a track and, and we did it live and it was like, hey, you know what? That well, it wasn't terrible. That was pretty good. Yeah. 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 There's a, there's a local group that I love in the Bay area called Hootenanny. Okay. Three guys, uh, acoustic guitar, acoustic, acoustic bass, uh, not, not an upright bass, but an acoustic four string bass. Sure. And, uh, and a drummer who has a, you know, like this kind of special kind of small, small drum kit. Yeah. All really good players, all really good singers. And they just tackle really interesting material and, and they pull off actually beginning to end. They pull, they pull off Rhapsody. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I want to see that someday. And then they, and then they play the rocking part on acoustic guitars. Right. Awesome. Right. Right. That's great. That's great. Ah, I love that sound. That sound means it's one of my favorite parts of the show where I get to talk to you about our sponsor, our friends at Banzoogle built by musicians for musicians. Banzoogle is the all in one platform that makes it super easy to build a beautiful website and electronic press kit for your music. They have all the features you need for a pro website, and it's already built in. Things like hosting your own custom domain name. That's where flingrocks.com is now. Yeah, we've moved Fling over to Banzoogle now, too. They have dozens of fully customizable design templates. They've got tools to sell your merch and your music, all commission-free. They've got crowdsourcing and fan subscription features, also commission-free. Mailing list tools. Yep. The fling mailing list is over at flingrocks.com and that's on Banzoogle that you can use to grow your fan list, send out newsletters, keep people up to date. That whole conversation we've been having on the show about pushing content out regularly. Well, this is the way you do it. Keeping your fans engaged makes you seem bigger than you are because you are a big deal already, but doing more makes more. All the social media integrations and live support from their musician-friendly team seven days a week. GigGab listeners, that's you. You can go to Banzoogle.com to try it free for 30 days and use the promo code GigGab. It's all one word. There's three G's. G-I-G-G-A-B. Use that as your promo code to get 15% off the first year of your subscription. That's Banzoogle.com, promo code GigGab. And our thanks to Banzoogle for doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. You know, uh, last week I was out in Las Vegas uh, at CES, my first time there since 2020, it turns out. Um, and I saw some things that actually rel related were related to this show. 
Um, the is there first, a lot of music stuff at CES? Um, there is not a ton. No, it's, it's, I mean, there is, if you look at it from the technology standpoint, there's plenty of audio there. There's plenty of, you know, that sort of thing there, but it, like Roland was there. They had their new mix station there and, and also some of their drums and all that stuff, but not a ton of, of music stuff there. Like I, as a musician, I would not recommend going and spending the money on a hotel room and you know, which in Vegas that week or like five times the price of a normal Vegas hotel room or anything. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, I saw there were two turntables that I saw at CES and, you know, bitter pill. We just released our, our, uh, back in the fall, uh, our, the vinyl for our living ain't cheap, dying ain't free. It's red vinyl. It's awesome. Um, but there were two turntables that I really liked. The JBL Spinner BT is a Bluetooth and wired turntable. Uh, comes out in the uh, probably late second quarter, I think, is is when we should see that. Maybe early third quarter. But um, it uses Aptex HD as the codec for uh, for sending over Bluetooth. I was shocked with the with the quality that you can get over Bluetooth. I mean, just in general, the quality you can get over Bluetooth these days is is impressive. And this thing really delivers. So the whole reason for going for vinyl is the warmth of vinyl, and you're saying it does not get lost using this codec. I mean, so it sounds like vinyl. Yes, I would say that the sound of vinyl does not get lost. I, I have a thing about vinyl. Um, it, uh, it's just there is a truth about vinyl. It's not my thing. I, like, I have no issues. If you like vinyl, then vinyl is great for you, right? I mean, the, the whole idea of confirmation bias actually works really well with sound. You know, if you bought a, a, a $20,000 set of speakers and you think they sound better, then they're going to they're gonna make you happier when you listen to them, right? There's nothing wrong with confirmation bias. That's also true of if you like CDs, if you like vinyl, if you like lossless. Um, there are some objective things about each of those. And one of the objective things about vinyl is that it completely like deteriorates the high end of a recording, which is why when things are mastered for vinyl, you goose the high end so that it compensates for the eventual loss. that's going to happen when you print it to vinyl. That's why when CDs came out, uh, they all sounded like tinny and harsh because they were taking the vinyl masters and just burning them to CDs. And then we were actually hearing what those masters sounded like, which we were never intended to do. But, um, but there's the whole experience of vinyl too, right? Like holding the record, having to flip it every, you know, 27 minutes. What, what's that? Holding the, 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 the album cover. The album cover. Right. There's the whole thing. And it, it can be a really social thing too. Like I, I love how, how uh, there's, you know, vinyl listening parties now where people will bring their vinyl and everything is, you know, 26 minutes or something. Uh, well, or at least until you flip to the other side, but it can, it can really be, an experience and it it's i think it's great that there are now lots of turntables that can work in a in in today's settings like you don't need a turntable with its own speakers which might be limiting what you're actually going to hear out of it or a turntable that plugs into an you know a fully analog system which you might not you might not have right so to be able to have bluetooth vinyl it makes, you know, you want to put stuff out on your patio and have a vinyl listening party. Great. Right. So, um, like I'm, I'm stoked about that. I think, I think it's going to be like three ninety nine, and it's coming out. Like I said, late Q2, Q3, it's the JBL spinner BT. There was also, uh, on the same topic, uh, the same subject, Victrola uh, has mm, I've seen that one. Right. It's that, well, they came out with a, a new, uh, version of it last week there it's the victola stream onyx which is less expensive than the other version that they came out with last year it's it's 599 so it's it's not inexpensive it's just less expensive than the other one mm -hmm. uh, but it's the same kind of thing and yes it works as a wired turntable if you want to plug it into your your amplifier system but it also works with sonos and one really cool thing is we got to demo it last week the there's a little knob on the front. You can use it to mute and unmute your Sonos. You can use it to change the volume on your Sonos. And it's smart enough so that if you have it streaming to your Sonos at the same time that you are spitting something out 
uh, the analog ports on the back, it will delay the sound on the analog ports to match the buffer that it's sending to your Sonos system. So everything is in sync, which is like no small technological feat, but it's completely transparent to the user. So I, I was, I was stoked about both of those things. I, I don't know. Like, I, like I like the technology. Cool. Yeah. I like the technology when it, when it works in a way that, um, that, that just is invisible to, to us as the user. There was another yeah. thing I saw. Uh, sorry. Did you have something about that, Paul? No. There's another thing I saw, and I'm not sure I understand this next product fully, but it's called the scene key. And it's from a company called mellow scene. And it is a VR music collaboration environment. It is uh, DAW agnostic, meaning it works with basically whatever digital workstation software you have on your computer. But what's cool is you could have one DAW on your computer and I could have a different DAW on mine. And we go into this VR environment. We use the, the scene key, which is a hardware device. It looks like a standard audio interface. It's got two inputs on it and an, you know, an output for either speakers or headphones and you can record things and then bounce tracks back and forth. So it allows for almost instantaneous collaboration. I don't, I don't know that it would actually work to play music at the same time, like live music, but being able to record and sort of share that experience of being in the studio and record and play back and mess with the track and, you know, bouncing things back and forth. It, it sort of facilitates that environment. I'm curious to see where they go with it. Uh, so it's the scene key from a company called mellow scene, M E L O S C E N E. I I'm, I need to, I need to, I need to learn more about this thing. Cause it's <laughs> I, it like, I, 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 I saw the people that created it and I saw some, some demos, but like, I haven't, touched it but it, it seems like something if you're collaborating i you know if you've ever been in the studio where you've got multiple people having ideas and trying to implement ideas it can be really frustrating because there is one workstation it, you know it's like it, if you've got too many cooks in the kitchen that can be a problem i feel like this might alleviate that because everybody gets to sort of play on their own and then collaborate on the final product almost simultaneously so cool uh, yeah Philosophically cool. Philosophically cool. I yeah, and I think they've got something to this. But I it, like, I, I I talked to them there, and I I started to get the idea. I visited the website. I dug into their videos, and it's like I I need to like I need to be in this. And it's all in a, a virtual environment, you know, a VR environment. You wear a headset when you're using the thing, and and so it sort of puts you all in the same place. You can see each other's DAW screens. So yeah, it's an interesting. I don't know. Report thing. back. I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then um, our friends at Presonus came out with two pieces of software recently that that I found interesting. The first is the version two of Notion for I iPhone and iPad. Notion is a comp uh, composition software. So if you're writing charts and all of that, the new one has pen and finger recognition. So you can it's got essentially handwriting recognition where you can chart out something and then it will turn it into a score for you, which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, and it's cross platform. It works. I mean, I think it, it, it's not just mobile. It's, you know, iPad, iPhone, Mac windows. I think they've got an Android version. So um, it, it, I haven't messed with it too much. I messed with it a little bit on my iPad and it was like, I charted out some, some stuff and it was like, boom, it just turned it into a chart for me. I was like, Oh, that's mm -hmm. actually yeah, that's actually pretty cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. Is is Nam happening? I haven't seen any buzz building for it. Yeah, it's um, yes, Nam is happening in April in L.A. April thirteenth to fifteenth in L.A. So, ah, uh, yeah. Would you? Uh, you've been to Nam before, right? I've been a couple times. It's it's really fun to go. I mean, I, I you know it's definitely worth the time. It's fun to just see people that you know wandering the you know the the aisles like anybody else just checking out new gear. It's fun to get demos from well-known musicians. It's fun to see new stuff first. It's it's you know a monstrously huge toy store for musicians. Huh. 
How um, I think it runs for three days, right? April 13th through 15th this year. How many would you recommend going for all three days? Is it worth like a one day thing? And I realize it's different for you because you're already on the West Coast, but just, uh, you know, for you, what's it work for? Yeah, I mean, um, I think there's, you probably get two different perspectives of it. Okay. If you're a good social person, you will meet other musicians and end up in some cool hangs and maybe at some cool parties or, you know, performances and stuff like that. If you're good at schmoozing in the booths and getting, you know, past it to some of the parties. Sure. You're, you know, then it's definitely a multi-day thing. If you're kind of a kind of a shy person and you, you know, yep. it, it's gigantic, but you might not have to look at band instruments or, or woodwind instruments or, or, you know, violas. Right. So, so to just kind of stick with the kind of cover band interested instruments, you probably do it in one good day. I okay. Think. Now, depending on how you do it, like, you know, how you do a show, if you go and you take long demos and you sit and you talk to people and really like to dig in for the meat, then I'd think probably two days, but, um, uh, you know, if you just want to kind of walk through and absorb everything, you could probably do it in a day. Huh. All right. Yeah. Cause I have it on my calendar. I, I, mean, I haven't booked, uh, a NAM pass or any flights yet, but I've got hotels booked cause that's how I, that's how I process things. It's like, all oh, right. Nice. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, we'll see, but it's, I, you know, mid COVID lockdown, I was like, you know, I've never been to NAM. This is ridiculous. I should go. Um, so uh, really fun. I mean, like huh. I said, I mean, I went one year. Yeah. Rick Derringer has a little guitar company. He's working his own little 10 by 10 booth. Rick, Rick freaking Derringer. That's right. Amazing. I mean, you know, the bigger, the bigger companies have celebrity demonstrations and then just freaking amazing, you know, local musicians you know, that they're working in their booth doing demonstrations. You learn a lot. It's fun to see brand new stuff. I think that's probably the biggest appeal to me. It's like whatever's brand new. And that's why I'm saying that, you know, I, I watch, I don't know, what, what, what's your favorite music site for n- product news? I use Music Radar. Yeah, that's pretty good. That I would say that's that's up on the top of my list. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Premier Guitar for guitar stuff um, and Music Radar for, for everything. So, that, and there doesn't seem to be that much of a, a drum beat starting yet. Hopefully it will start soon. Well, you know, the drum world has PASIC which is uh, the percussion arts society. I don't know, whatever it's, it's, it's the, per- it's, it's the drum show every year. And, okay. uh, and, and so, and that's another one that I would like to go to. It, it, it just happened, I think in November, December, maybe. Um, you should ping Don in my band. Cause you know, he's uh, the drum department manager at a really good music store. Oh, yeah. He'll definitely be down there. So you should go hang with Don. Yeah. All right. All right. And actually, Talking about going back to our conversation about rehearsal. Yeah. Don is, you know, he's got a family. He's got a busy work life. He's very careful with his time. He wants to not waste any time. He comes prepared, prepared. Like I would say that's something he's brought into our rehearsals. That is interesting. Almost intimidating. He does not mess around. He is prepared. Yeah. Well, he's, and he's played with, some A-list environments, right? Like mm-hmm. he, he recorded with, I think the Doobie brothers, you said, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I, I've, and, and, you know, when we had, um, oh crap, why can't I think of his name? The guy who makes the software, David. Oh man. He's going to kick my butt for not remembering his last name. Uh, who, the, the, the guy who played in all the tribute bands, uh, that we mm-hmm. had on the show, he said the same thing. Like nobody shows up and, uh, and, and needs to learn something. David Jameson. Sorry. He make he writes gig performer and, uh, you know, he plays with Trey Gunn, Jerry Murata and people at that level. And he said, you, you don't show up at rehearsal wanting to practice. You show up at rehearsal knowing the songs cold, and then you play them together and work out the arrangements and the blend and, you know, all of those things that you can do when everybody knows their stuff walking in the room. So, yeah. 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 Right. Interesting. Good. Interesting. Cool. There was one more piece of software that I'm going to mention because I want to, uh, I want to check this particular box and I want to make sure everybody knows personas has a second piece of software out. Uh, it's studio one version six. And this has it's that's their speaking of DAWs. This is their DAW 
which just keeps getting better and better. I, I'm still a logic person because it's what I learned and what I use. But every time I launch Studio One to experience it, you know, every time there's a there's a new version out or or something I want to experience with it, I always think, man, you know, like I, there's there's things about this that are smoother and simpler than logic, and maybe I should move my world over there. The new version has uh, it. They they've added the whole video track thing, which Logic has had, uh, so that you can like score a video. They've also got lyrics integration right there inside Studio One, which um, and they've 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 created some or allow you to create some presets for tracks now. So you can be like, all right, this is what I use for a kick drum. I want to put a kick drum in. It's my own thing. And boom, it just pulls the preset in. So it was with version six, it's gotten to a point where it's like, okay, I don't feel like there's anything missing from this. And it's got some smoother workflow stuff. So I don't know. It's, you know, it's hard to change. Do you have a, an iOS interface that you like? For, for what? For iPad, doing iPad or, or phone? Like recording on the phone? Yeah. I haven't done a ton with it. Um, I, no, I, I mean, I, I use my iPad with logic, but, but it's just a remote control. Um, you know, it's, it's just like the logic remote for, um, for, for iPad and it just controls logic that's on my Mac. Right. So, no, no. Yeah. If, if you want to like use garage band or something just to give good, idea, clean, good ideas in, you know, when you're out and about somewhere, I wouldn't, I'm thinking about an iOS interface. There is. Persona has a new one out. Yeah, they, I, I, they might. The USB C basically connection. Yep. Yeah, um, the, I, I mean, most interfaces will work with an iPad. The trick is getting software that will see them. And there is some software. There's one DAW for the iPad that begins with an F, and I can't remember the name of it. Um, but, it, but it it'll do the whole multi track thing and and make that make that work. I, it's driving me crazy. I'm looking at different <laughs> uh, different things for the iPad. Like you'll remember in the middle of the night. It, yeah, exactly. Well, I, you know, I found David Jameson's name, so there you go. <laughs> I mean, GarageBand will do some of it. Um, why can't I remember? Well, the I know names? everything that I've tried. Um, uh, voice memos will will recognize uh, an interface, but not so, for multi track, right? Oh, actually, that's a good point. I don't know. I think it just goes in as it doesn't, you know, voice memos doesn't do multi track. So, but I think it just sums them and gives you gives you one track, maybe left and right. It, right. Yeah. It'll give you right. It'll give you yes. It, yeah. Left and right. Yeah. I'm looking here. Oh, gosh, nothing's coming up. No, I got nothing. Four somebody, track? somebody will send it in feedback at giggabpodcast.com because we, we got a four track. It's not four track. It's something else. It's driving mm. me crazy to not know, but I don't know. It's not Call coming up. Yeah. It's, it's what a bunch of podcasters use, uh, to record multi-track podcast. You know, if you got like multiple guests or whatever, people do it for right. a podcast. Um, and they do it on the iPad. So I, we'll, we'll figure it out. But if you know, send it to us feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to know, I guess. That's good. Yeah. All right. We got anything else? No. Okay. Easy, easing into the new year, you know, just kind of right. getting our mojo going. Yeah, getting our mojo going. It is. It's good mojo. Here we are, 44 minutes. Amazing. Good stuff. Nice. All right. Well, that's what I got. That's uh, All right. That's where hey, we are. Good. Yeah. Always be performing. That's the idea. Can't not be. What's the point, otherwise? Even when you're rehearsing. Especially. Uh, no. Nah, yeah. You can. You can notch it down a little bit. Yeah, that's right. You don't want to be a jerk about it. Yeah, don't be that guy.